what we do here is go back, 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 back. All right, uh, welcome the guys from Dark Matter, of course, Alex Valari and Jeff Taravanian. Come on. Hey, 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 hey. Oh, sorry, we, we, we scarfed down pizza and then ran out there. And that's that's exactly right. Yeah. Guys, good. thanks for being here. Thank you for having us. And uh, congratulations on all your success. Here in Canada, of course, if you get uh, three seasons of a TV series, it's considered a runaway hit. <laughs> Well, we did just that and ran away right and after. Ran away with <laughs> yeah. So much of, I think a lot of people don't know, so much of Canadian TV is, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I think there's been more single series, <coughs> single season series in Canada than probably any other country. Yeah. It seems that there's a, a lot of that that happens, but, you know, Dark Matter, and it, it started that way, and then, you know, it was renewed for a second, it was like, yeah, you know, and then fan, uh, Outcry, I guess. You got the third season going and everything, and yeah. uh, still it's such a strong cult following. You know, you got this really strong fan base to this day. Absolutely. And and here you guys are. Has it been quite the ride or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To say the least, man. Like it, it's it's been a roller coaster, like even up and down of just going back and forth with the producers, with them being so hopeful of like this could possibly still go on, and uh, we're still working on that. We'll see where they go. I mean, they're hopeful. I mean, Joe Malazzi, the uh, showrunner and creator, it's, it's super hopeful about it. He's worked really hard. He's really obsessed. He's, a, he's an obsessive person. Once he starts something, he finishes it. Um, and, and he really wants to give the fans what they deserve. Um, and that's the entire storyline of what it is. And, and no matter how it comes, you know, whether it's a movie or a miniseries, they're, uh, they're hopeful, or he's hopeful about it. And yeah, he's out with Vanessa. You know, so who produced the first season right now in LA, pitching some new things, Timescape, I'm sure you probably heard of it. Yeah. Uh, and, and meeting with some people to see what they can do with Dark Matter. So, yeah. Is, is that the ultimate goal, you think? Just like a, a mini series or perhaps a movie to tie up loose ends and kind of finish the story? I mean, the ultimate goal would always be the complete five seasons. Yeah. Yeah, but um, yeah. I think the hopeful goal is to just to tie up the loose ends because it, it ended at a horrible place. Yeah. Um, where we were about to introduce <laughs> aliens, um, six is possibly dead. And two, God knows what's happening with her. Uh, and she has a daughter on the way. I, I spilled beans on a whole lot of people. <laughs> and no one has any closure, so it can't be mentally healthy for their characters. So we'll see. Is that on the table? Another couple of seasons? Do you think? Uh, it just depends on, on the legal <laughs> stuff. <yeah. laughs> yeah, I mean, it, like, like Alex said, uh, Joe's dream is to definitely finish it. There's a lot of people. I just finished a show with, with Joe. Uh, over the winter time called Utopia Falls and he's the showrunner on that as well and he brought me out which was amazing but you can tell his heart is still broken by dark matter and he wants to finish it like no wall. I mean it was such a good group of people mm -hmm. that um, probably 70% of the crew on Utopia Falls behind the scenes was all all dark matter people which was great because it was like you're going to work with a family again and I always joke that you know these guys were main cast I was like a, a good close cousin they treated me like Family that I forgot you were on the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was your yeah. No, I never got to work with you. Well, that's true. We, we never, we, well, we did that one scene no. where, where I got shot and you guys all came through when everybody was escaping from prison. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was so nervous that day because yeah. the shot ended up on me being shot. And I was so afraid that I would blow it with this uh, squibs, they call them, they blow blood out and stuff like that. So I was nervous and I hardly talked to you. But, we did a Comic Con in London, England last year that finally we got to hang out for the first time. Yeah. And because I didn't know him, I expected him to be the real, uh, very serious. You know? yeah. <laughs> like, I, I don't know why. You, just, you see him every day like that, right? So when I meet him, he's like crazy nutcase goof, goofball guy. It's like it's really fun. So it was a completely different person than I expected. But yeah, we didn't get to do scenes. No. No. We need a reunion. We have really good chemistry, though. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, we just had a sword fight. <laughs> um, what does, uh, I'm trying to think of the right way to say this, 
I mean, everyone I think, especially every actor I think, when they get a genre show, sci-fi or whatever, they <coughs> often think of this. They think of the conventions, you know, and they think of that because even a even a unpopular science fiction TV show is really popular to science fiction fans. Yeah. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. You know. And so, and, and there, there are endless possibilities, you know. Star Trek came back numerous times and continues to. Veronica Mars, although not science fiction, but I mean, we saw what happened with that, with the rabid fan base or whatever. <clears throat> was that one of those things when you guys signed on to do the show, that in the back of your mind you were like, sweet, you know, sci-fi has like the most loyal fans, and that's a bonus here. I mean, obviously actors want to take work, but is that like kind of I was a bonus? just happy to work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Dark Matter was my first like regular yeah. um, series, so I was just happy to worry. I had no idea about the sci-fi world until I did my first convention. I think it was Fan Expo, and I was just so surprised. Like, who are these people? Why are you all dressed up? And I couldn't, I couldn't understand it. And and now it's, I never want to leave sci-fi. I'm just, like, I tell my agents all the time, get me back into sci-fi. That's where I want to be. <clears throat> Because you get that engagement with fans where it's, you get that reward where other series, you, you don't get to ever meet the fans, man. It's, yeah. it's, it's, really, it's really weird now to, to not go to conventions or to shoot something and then not go to a convention for it, to answer questions, to meet fans, to say thank you for tuning in and supporting, um, one, the show, but two, me. And, um, yeah, but the cast of, you know, the cast yeah. of uh, This Is Us, <laughs> it's never going to have this kind of interaction, you know. No. Never going to have these conventions and things to go to no. to really meet with people and hear what they love about the characters in the show, right? Yeah, I agree. And, and, and as, as fortunate as they are, I met Melanie uh, Lieber, who played Nix on season two, is on This Is Us, and she's getting, you know, to do a whole lot of cool things. But it's not conventions, man. It's, it's, there's nothing like meeting fans, and it's it's really cool. Yeah. So I'm, I'm excited. About it. I, I get excited. About it. Jeff, what about you? Oh, same. I, I feel fortunate to do them in the first place because, again, I, I don't feel like uh, you, know, you were a series regular. I was a recurring character. So the fact that we had you on the show. <laughs> I told you this back there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, go ahead. Anyways, um, yeah, it was, I just I feel very, very blessed to be able to do it. Um, the real drag for me was that on the next season coming out, I was becoming a series regular. So okay. it's. Uh, Oh, it is what it is. <laughs> bittersweet. Yeah, but um, yeah, I, I'm very fortunate. I love doing them, and I, I've done other sci-fi shows too, like uh, some things for Twelve Monkeys and stuff, which was another great show to work on. Although, again, it was just a, Dark Matter was more like a family atmosphere to me. When you showed up on set, you felt like you were really part of something, as opposed to I don't know. Not that say Twelve Monkeys was a bad set; it was great. It was just it was, it was different. Mm -hmm. A lot of sets you go on too. I mean. You go into some features and you're, you just feel like you're part of the, the cog, unless you're the, the big star of the, the movie, you know, you're just, you know, you're one of those big players. Mm -hmm. Walking on a set every day with Dark Matter people, it's great. They make you feel like a hundred bucks, a hundred thousand bucks, maybe a million bucks, I don't know, something like that. Adjusted for a Canadian, that would be like $8,000? Yeah. <laughs> something like that, right? Is that what <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I was talking to the Power Ranger guys a little while ago. They were talking about the different places where they go when they do the conventions and everything like that. And they were surprised at how rabid the fan base is in parts of Europe. Yeah. Is, are there part, is it like that with you guys where you go to certain places where you're like, oh my God, here were like the Beatles. Yeah. You know, yeah. here were like the monkeys. Like, what, like, when we, when we did uh, London, there was yeah. people from all over Germany and all those places that came over because it was a dark matter sort of specific con. Mm -hmm. And again, you're, you're Florida, you're meeting these people from all over Europe, Czech, uh, Czech Republic, uh, yeah, all, yeah, they, yeah, just all, all flying in for the reason to come and meet you, and you can't believe it, because again, like, I mean, again, I, I'll give Alex more, because, you know, he was a series regular on it, but when you got people showing up with, dressed as you, or, like, you know, like, I couldn't get over that, or, you know, they bring you cakes and stuff with your picture on it, and, it's uh, it's pretty cool. It's got a cake in your picture. Well, it's my birthday. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of well, you also shouldn't shouldn't sell yourself short there, Jeff, because a lot of times those recurring characters are beloved just as much, if not more, oh, yeah. than some regulars. I mean, if you look at uh, 
a Q on uh, Next Generation oh, yeah. as an example. You know, um, I, I can't off the top of my head think of some others right now, but I mean, there, there's yeah, a lot of times those recurring characters become hugely popular. I mean, even in Star Wars, Boba Fett was never meant to be this yeah, it's not funny. iconic character that he is, right? It was my favorite when I was a kid. Yeah. Anders was not meant to become a regular man. You oh. stole the show as Anders, and fans loved you, and Joe loved you, and kept writing you even more and more. Yeah, I lucked out, actually. Yeah. You didn't luck out, so you, you did well, man. Yeah. Oh, it would have been nice to have him on set. What a romance this is. Like, <laughs> yeah, man, that's my road dog. How many conventions do you guys do here? It depends. Yeah, I don't know. Three I just started, I just got a convention agent, so like now, now they, they've started to come and everyone's been asking, like, why don't we do more conventions? But it's just, I didn't know about <laughs> convention agents or any of that sort or any of that, but I love them. It was, you uh, well, yeah, I just started too, though. You know what was that sort of got me into the idea was was Anthony Lemke, who uh, mm. played three in that. Um, we were talking about it on set one day. Because Zoe obviously does a lot through, uh, through the Lost Girl stuff as well, and then, and then uh, with Dark Matter. So yeah, she's she's so busy now, actually, on film, that I don't think she has time for conventions at the time. Yeah. She just goes from project to project. Yeah, we did a Lost Girl panel here last exactly. year. And uh, yeah, and, and Zoe and several members of the cast. The, um, the Power Ranger guys said that their busiest year, they did two a month for a full wow. year. Oh, that'd be fun. That's like a full-time full job. Oh, 100%, yeah. Yeah. 100%. It is, it is like a full-time job, right? Yeah. So what, what do you think? Would you do 24 in a year? <laughs> I, 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 I'm with Alex, man. I love it. I just, yeah. I love getting out and meeting people and, and talking. You know, that, that much was as fun as it is. You know, you're hanging around your peers, people you know and that, so it's always good to catch up. Like, I haven't seen you since we were in LA. We bunked together in LA for a few weeks, I think, in yeah. the spring. But, you, know, you get busy and, you know, but yeah. So, you know, you talk about it being like a family uh, on set, and, and you guys obviously get along, there's a lot of joking around and everything like that. What's the hard part about filming a show like Dark Matter? What's the hardest part of doing it? You know, you're with your family, your friends, you're having a good time, obviously, and it's great to be working as an actor, but I mean, what's what's the most grueling part of doing that show? I know it is for me, if you go ahead. You remember as <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, but again, I will say, like, the, 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 the moves and the fighting sequences that you figured out so fast, it's, because I did watch you rehearse as well, and it's just like, like, he's unbelievable. And Melissa too, watching. actually. You were watching me. I honestly, because well, if you, in that one scene we were talking about, I think I, I stood in the back with a mat, practicing a silly little thing for like hours. Yeah. John Stead, who's the fight coordinator, would always say, like, he loved the fact that I tried so hard, but I'm terrible. So I would, you know, I didn't want to be the weak link, so I would be up practicing like crazy where these guys would, you know, what do I do? I do this, do that? Yeah, okay, got it. And they'd just do it. So, but I don't know if that's hard for you or. No, no, John Stead was an incredible teacher. He, he does a lot of the Stratford plays and just such a, such a good um, stunt coordinator. And he has a way of teaching and, and creating choreography where everything flows. So if I'm slicing this way, he'll have someone else coming this way because my momentum's coming that way. So it's easy to remember because it just wouldn't make sense to come this way and then turn around or do whatever. Anyways, the choreography flowed and he made it very simple for me and it made it look really, really cool, and then the stunt performers did a great, because they were professionals, and then have been doing it for such a long time, they make it look like you know what the hell you're doing. Meanwhile, I'm just like, I'm slicing this way, I'm slicing that way, cool, you guys jump and flip, make it look like I did it well. Um, but the hardest part for me was this, the third season where I was the emperor, um, because I was, always out here in Kitchener and Waterloo filming the uh, Zyron scenes in the castle. It's it's actually up the street from here. It's not far. Hacienda Sierra Banquet Hall or something like that. So that's that's the Zyron castle. Um, and it was being away from the main cast uh, who was my family. And so, you know, you get renewed for third season. Yes, I get to spend all day with these guys again for the next few months. But then they tell you, oh, um, but you're going to be filming out here, and you're not going to be with. You're hardly going to see them. 
Uh, that was that was hard, man. Just not being with them and shooting so many of the scenes with new faces. Not that they the new faces were bad or anything. It's just that's not my family. And part of the job was enjoying being with these guys all the time. What was the hardest part for you? The hardest part for me always is, uh, although it's getting better, is getting lines down. Um, I've had a lot of head, head injuries, which I'm half joking about. I'm assuming that's why it's hard. I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's, you know, you, sometimes you're at a lot of time to, to get the scripts and learn them, especially in the audition process. So for me, that's, if I didn't have so much trouble with the lion, I would just love every second of it. I, I love being on set. I love when we're actually doing what we're doing. It's it's magic. But it's that that awful anxiety beforehand. Do I have this stuff down? Again, with Utopia Falls, um, there was some screw-ups with, with scheduling. And I remember one time they gave me, I had a six-page scene with most of me talking. And they gave it to me the night before and said, here you go. <laughs> I was like nervous breakdown, you know, by four in the morning still trying to get this stuff down. You know, it, it, I'm learning now that with, with film and TV, you can't make mistakes and just pick it up. I always wanted to be, you know, I wanted to have everything down so I wouldn't be the guy that was interrupting things. But. Like you do in theater, right? Like, you, like yeah. you know, in, you, in your head, you want to have the entire script memorized front to back and just go out there as if you're doing a live show. Yeah. Right? Well, I did, I mean, I, it took a long time for me to start getting better roles. You know, I came out in nowhere where I wasn't really trained, so I was learning as I was going. So I did a lot of these sort of rinky-dink things. And you don't want to be the guy that blows those parts because, you know, you won't be brought back. So I think that always stuck in my head that, you know, you have to be rock solid on this. So. Um, <clears throat> do you guys remember the movie Hook? Robin Williams, and yeah. they said that, uh, going back to what you were saying, being away from your family, Julia Roberts played Tinkerbell in that movie and hated it, hated every minute of it because she didn't act with anybody. The entire Tinkerbell was all done on a green screen mm -hmm. away from everybody else. So she never actually got to work with anybody except for, I think, one scene that she got with, with Robin Williams in just one part, right? So. Is there is there also a lot of that when you're working with special effects and things like that, where you essentially, it looks like you're all together, it looks like you're doing more than you are, but you're just kind of by yourself, lonely, in front of the green screen? No, we had a lot of practical, actually most of our sets were practical sets. Yeah. Right? And uh, even the green screen stuff, uh, the other actor would usually come in, like what the stuff I would do with Roger and that. Yeah. He, like I would love, the, love him for that, because I don't know, you've seen it, sometimes the uh, lead in another thing will just sort of disappear and you're talking to a tennis ball. Literally, um, yeah, yeah. Literally a tennis ball. Or, you know, and someone else would just read the lines, but these guys would always be there when I was doing that. So yeah, it was, we never had that. I watched the movie. Um, you, you know, you and I are around the same age, probably, and uh, I watched Cannibal Run Part Two mm -hmm. not too long ago. It's part of Bad Movie Night or whatever, and there's uh, an entire scene with Frank Sinatra, with the cast talking to Frank Sinatra sitting behind a desk, and Sinatra refused to go to the set or do anything, so he filmed his entire scene at a desk somewhere else. One take, and he got paid, and he left, and so, it, but in the movie, it's just the actors talking yeah. like this, and it cuts, and there's a stand-in's head. <laughs> it's not Frank Sinatra. All the, all the people are, one of those guys go, what was it like working with Sinatra? It was great. Oh, man, I couldn't do that. And they never met him. Oh, that's... <laughs> they never met him. No. I, I had a... Um, I did a show called Designated Survivor with, uh, it was great, with Kiefer Sutherland. He was amazing, like, he, was a, he was a good guy. Although I did see him lose him on, on somebody on set, because he has a reputation for that, so I did see it. But um, he was great with me, but yeah, at the last scene, he was inducting a, an actor named Al Blacksman into the Canadian Walk of Fame. Yep. So he's like, I'm so sorry, I gotta go. So I did get the, the ball, <laughs> and the, uh, the, one of the ADs read, but it was fine, because like, he told me up ahead of time, he said, I'm so oh, sorry, okay. I gotta go. So he wasn't a jerk about it. It happened. Did you catch him at his trailer uh, singing? Country songs? Song? Singing yeah. country songs? No, no. Yeah, yeah. We talked about that, though, in makeup, man. Yeah. Yeah, he was really good he was just He just finished the tour when uh, we did that episode, yeah. He's good. Yeah, he's good. He's good. This guy can sing good country as well. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously, he's good. We did karaoke in LA, and uh, no, you banged that off, man. Uh, karaoke aside, do you have aspirations to sing? No, oh, okay. you know, I'm a terrible voice, man. I just feel like, listen, I'm Filipino, so I can do one of two things. I can either sing or dance. 
I can't sing and I can hardly dance. And it's, it's amazing that I'm even on screen as a Filipino guy because there are no Filipino roles ever. Yeah. So, yeah. So your choice is dark matter or singing for journey. Yeah. Or singing for journey. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Man. Yeah. yeah I didn't get singing at all. I would really wish that you could sing. You know what to sing? Lemke. That's what I was going to say. Andy Lemke is a great singer, man. Yeah. He belting out journey. Journey. Yeah. Was he, don't, and he also did uh, Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi. Jo yeah. On a prairie. That was surprising. <laughs> so this guy and, and Lemke were in, uh, they had a band back in the Jesus days. Yeah, a long time ago, yeah. Yeah, right. Dinosaurs. Do you sing? I so, used to, yeah. I used to be a professional yeah, singer. We had videos on much music and all kinds of stuff. What was the band? I'm not telling. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody Google it. Yeah. You don't find it. That's the best part. It was like before the internet came out. So we're there, but it's hard to find. Wow. And you were signed. You were signed, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it was, yeah, it was a different time. How many albums did you do? Uh, did two was the, almost the name. And then, uh -huh. I, and then I did a solo record as well. Really? Yeah. Actually, my first band that was, did I've interviewed you before, and I don't know why, I've never been able to find this info. No, we, I, I, my first band actually was, uh, did anybody know Our Lady Peace or like that? Yeah. Um, sure. Mike, the guitarist from that band, he was in my band as well. Um, and they, they're, Our Lady Peace, when they became Our Lady Peace, used to open up for the other band a lot, because we're still good friends. But yeah, actually the first first uh, rehearsal spot too, because we were with Jay Gold from Canadian Idol, I guess it was then. Mm -hmm. But um, they put us in a rehearsal spot on Richmond Street in Toronto and we, we shared it with uh, the Tragically Hip, who were just starting to break big at that point. So yeah, I mean, we really cool. Hey, do you want to go back to that at all? No, no, not at all. In fact, I'm really happy that it never panned out uh, the way we'd hoped because it's, it's a weird lifestyle and it's hard in Canada. It's really difficult to, to make a living. You're on the road a lot. Um, I love my, my family, my daughter especially, and I can't imagine just uh, you know taking off for three, six, seven months at a time and you know, Skyping with her. Um, I, I shoot something, I'm gone for like a week or something, I feel bad. So yeah, I mean, it's just a different kind of world to me. And the thing I love about uh, film and television is you have great relationships, uh, everybody from the biggest stars I've worked with down to whatever, they all are pulling in one direction, they want to make a good product. I think I was telling somebody here earlier that um, you, when you're in a band and you're opening up for one of your heroes, uh, you have a good sound check because you want to impress them because you, you admire them. And then you find out later that your sound's all screwed up because the band doesn't want you to sound good. And you're thinking, I love these guys, how could they do that to us? But that happens, you know, that's music industry was just insane. Very cutthroat kind of place. A lot of people don't know the opening act sometimes don't even meet that other band. Yeah, it yeah. happens a lot. I've had friends that were in bands that did well and they got to open for big names and they were so excited about it. And I said, well, what were they like? And they go, I never met them. So or, or, they, or they met them in passing, you know what I mean, like in a hallway, but they yeah. didn't really they didn't get to hang with the other band. They didn't get to be friends with a great hope or whatever. Um, do you both still live in Toronto? Do yeah. you both still live in Toronto? Yeah. So, what do you think about it? it seems that so so many of us creative types here in Canada um, <clears throat> wind up half at least half a year in like LA or whatever. Do you guys want to do that as well, or do you do that? I don't want to do it. No. 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 I, I have a, I'm a son, and um, like you got your daughter, and, and yeah, I'm a family guy, man. I, I didn't think I ever would be. Um, you know, young guy just. I was all about my grades and my aspirations, this and that. And then my boy came along, and I was like, "No, I, this, this is it." So I just want to be at home with my kid all the damn time. Um, LA is fun. Like if work takes me there, work takes me there. And if not, I, I told my man, my age is like, I, I don't want to go chasing out in LA. I just, I just feel like that's it's just such a place of dead dreams, man. And and there's such everyone comes to Toronto to shoot anyways. You know, so I'll, I'll go and audition in LA and then just come work up here. And I, and I don't have to deal with Trump. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah but having said that, how often do we get to hang out with Ron Jeremy every day? Yeah, I guess you're right. I guess you're right. That was, <laughs> we, that we're was down a in spring. Every night, I took him to the Rainbow Bar, uh, which is one of the old rock hangouts, and uh, he ended up loving it. But, yeah. One of the one of the guys who's there every night was Ron Jeremy, and he took a shine to us for some reason. So it's like it was just it was bizarre. Yeah. You know, every night, yeah. Ron, 
Uh, yeah, he's a he's a strange cat. And he's and he's a fanboy. Yeah, Ron Jeremy's a fanboy. The like, weirdest he, thing though, he like, loves TV and movies, and he loves yeah. to talk TV and movies. Have you have you interviewed him? Because he, he's he's just he's different. Yeah, he's intelligent. <laughs> he is intelligent. Before he was in porn, he was a, a teacher. He was a, yeah. a high school teacher. He's an intelligent guy, but he's a little. Um, you know, there, when he when we first met us, he was asking us if we were like Mossad or no, something like that. No, no, no. Like, no. He was like, he's sitting in this chair. We we come down. Everyone here knows who Ron Jeremy is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Most he's he's looking most, at us. He was famous acting at us, and he's just like. He was really? <laughs> um, for me, I'm like, okay, maybe Jeff, but I'm like, are you just looking at me here? He's just like, yeah, you from the Israeli army? And I was just like, you guys you guys look look like, like, you know, like, like, you guys look like Messiah or something. Messiah? No, okay, come sit down, come sit down. He sat down, man, he smelled bad. <laughs> yeah, that's something interesting. I'm glad, it's funny you say that. I don't say that to a lot of people, but when they talk about Ron Jeremy, I go, you'd be surprised he, uh, he smelled. Yeah, he's got a he's got an odor. Yeah, <laughs> so you were not filming this. Okay, uh, <laughs> it's all right. What was he gonna do? Not put me in a porn? Yeah, yeah I don't <laughs> want to be in one. Yeah, true. I'm good. <laughs> um, it's kind of a funny thing because you know my background is stand-up comedy and, yeah. and acting and writing and everything, and uh, I can't stand up. And it's everyone oh, seems to go there. Everyone loves it. And all. I like to go for five days. But yeah. I don't want to live there either. And, and, and part of it is I'm also that weird guy that, that loves the seasons and I don't mind the winter or whatever. But then part of me is also just, boy, it's exhausting enough living in this city knowing yeah. how many actors and performers there are yeah. in LA to see people very, very talented and very, very beautiful parking cars. It's, yeah. it's almost like people are like, oh, LA is so beautiful. And I go, and yet I, I always feel a little depressed yeah. <laughs> when I go. So, I don't know, man. Did you get to do, a, like, a, did you do a tour for your, um, for your shows or anything? Like, did you do a Well, I mean, much show? like that's the thing is I don't tour anymore. Just yeah. like, uh, not to make this all about me, but uh, I understand where you're coming from. Because as a comedian, it was the only way to make money, mm -hmm. right? So when I met my now wife, I was on the road 49 weeks a year all over North America, because oh, wow, yeah. it's the only way to make money. And then I cut it down to about 40 weeks a year for a while, and then and now I'm not touring. Wow, that's I'm, tough. A, I'm not touring now, for, yeah. I, have two, I have two girls. And it's the same thing. You, you don't want to be, one of the hardest parts about being a creative type, and, and you guys I'm sure will agree, is you don't want to be an absentee father. You don't want to be an absent yeah. father. You don't want to go out, and, and maybe you're happy. You know, like, look at all this work I did. But you don't want to come home and go. I I missed my kid's childhood. Yeah. I missed the toddler years. Absolutely. I missed it. And that, and those are those years are so much fun. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That's that's the thing is that you can't. Yeah. It's probably the best time, and that's where you're going to bond with them as well. Totally. You know. I I, I I think I told you I got a friend who's a seal. He's one. We dive together, and that was a great guy to dive with because you're safe all the time. But he's got a video that he showed me once of him meeting his daughter for the first time, and she was already two years old at that point because he had been in Iraq and then Afghanistan, yep. you know, constantly on missions and stuff. You know, he's like, "Here's." Your, I remember Dorinda says, uh, "says Don't know. He'll get used to you soon. She'll get used to you soon." You know, oh, imagine like you're looking at your little kid, and the kid doesn't know who you are, but they've been hyped up, so they're they're trying to act like a kid. You know, it was a bizarre situation. But at least he can say, you know, I was out there saving the world. You know, I gotta say, well, you know, I was doing punch up on Sharknado. <laughs> <laughs> you were on Sharknado? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I did but, well. like, but oh yeah, no, but but you know, and, and that is a drawback to yeah. to what we do, to what or especially what you guys do, um, perform, you know, acting, and it can it can it can as luck would have it, we film a lot in Ontario. Yeah. But yeah. Um, it could take you over to, you know, Romania for six weeks or three months or something like that. Yeah, you know, it's, Moscow for yeah, you did months. months. What'd you do in Moscow? A terrible series called uh, Insomnia. I wrote that. <laughs> it, you did a very bad job. <laughs> but, um, no, it's yeah, it was it was a it was a funny Wait, experience. I heard Insomnia. Who is that? Who put that up? Don't check it out. No? Uh, Stars purchased the rights to it, I think, just to keep it off television. Really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think it aired in, like, Paris or something. Oh, really? Once. Yeah, yeah. It was 
it was a fun experience to shoot. Oh, I know. Yeah, man. Yeah, awesome. And then right after that, Shashi goes uh, from Insomnia yeah, ended up on Dark Matter. So it was, it was really cool. What's um, what's the best like? What's the place that you've uh, gone to work at where you love being there? Like, did you love being in Moscow, or was it like? I did. Yeah, I did. It was it was tons of fun. Um, I, I'd say Vancouver. Yeah, Vancouver is probably my favorite place to, to be in to shoot. Yeah, Hamilton. Really? No, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I was like, what? No, I, I, I did a movie in last winter uh, in Costa Rica. It was unbelievable. Uh, we shot at this giant mansion on a on a cliff side overlooking the, the ocean. It was part of the and each night we would have a turn staying in the master bedroom there, and it was, yeah, you wake up, you got monkeys all over your thing, and mm -hmm. there's all these different animals. And you had monkeys all over your thing. Mine, there was monkeys all over my thing. And, uh, it was actually, that was the best part. It was actually the band. Oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, no, that, he was opening for us. But yeah, the town we stayed in too, Montezuma, was really nice. The people were... What was the movie? Uh, I don't know what the name of it is going to be in, because it's still not released. Uh, it was called Jade's Asylum, but... Uh, I don't know, but it's it'll be out soon. It's a thriller, horror. action. Yeah, it's a horror movie. Um, oh. Hopefully, it's good. Uh, all I know is I got to go to Costa Rica for <laughs> for weeks on end and hang out in the jungle. So it was fun. That's now, where's somewhere you don't want to go back to? Hamilton. <laughs> no, actually, I enjoyed it there. Yeah, One of our producers, uh, Ivan Bartok, though, he was on Sufferies, where he hated going there because he was always sick, man. Yeah. Uh, we shoot a lot. There's a lot that gets shot in Hamilton as well. Yeah, it's yeah, good. Yeah, uh, Hamilton. Have you seen Christmas Street there? No. Was it an actual like made up Christmas? Thing? There's so many Christmas movies that get shot in Hamilton that there's like a couple of streets where the Christmas decorations just kind of stay up all the time, so the productions can use them. Well, they went. Good. They, they they went pretty hog wild with Christmas stuff. For I know Netflix made something like. 30 movies last year that were Christmas based. Yeah, yeah there's all, and plus the other networks as well. I don't know, I was lucky. Did you ever guys, anyone see Christmas Chronicles? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Or Russell. Yeah, I played the bad guy in that. But that was cool. But it was funny because uh, obviously Canada is known for uh, snow and stuff like that. And we, we went to shoot all the outdoor stuff, the snow completely disappeared. So it was amazing. We went to downtown Toronto. And like, I don't know, almost two blocks of snow blankets. It was unbelievable. You know you're in a big budget thing though when they had that. Yeah. It was yeah. just snow blankets everywhere. And the day and a half after we finished shooting that stuff, there was this much snow. Oh, geez. just so typical of Canada. Yeah. You know? Well, in Canada is the number one spot to film Christmas movies. So and that was my first paid writing day because I wrote a Hallmark Christmas movie. Are you kidding? Really? Yeah, yeah it's true. Yeah. So, and uh, uh, out next year. But the, the, you said Netflix did 30. Hallmark has announced that they're going to launch a yeah, whole sorry, new that's channel. Right. That's what I meant. Hallmark was that, that was the one, yeah. But Hallmark's going to launch a whole new channel where they play Christmas movies year round. That's crazy. They're on, yeah. And, and, I and, love and, Christmas, but. Yeah. Well, they're also getting into, that's you know, um, other holidays. They want to do like Valentine's movies, and they want to do Halloween movies, and they want to do, but they essentially want to do these seasonal. You know, features these rom coms or whatever. Yeah. So, do you guys audition for a lot of the Christmas movies? Because because that is also a rite of passage in Canada no. to have done a Christmas movie. You haven't done one yet. I don't want to do it. No. no. Why not? Oh, come on. I don't want to do it. So yeah. I, I I loved it because I love Christmas movies ever since I was a kid. We watch them every year, a lot of yeah. the same ones. And I was I was even saying to my daughter last year, um, we're watching It's a Wonderful Life, and I was pointing out that Potter and the old guy in the movie was born in eighteen seventies. And yet, we're still watching every year. So yeah, he's been dead a long time, but he's there. It's, it's cool to me. You know, it's one of those movies that will stay around for a long time. And I, you know, I, I've always wondered what it would be like to be in the Christmas story with Peter Billingsley, the, yeah. the kid with the no. rifle and stuff. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, but you guys know it, right? You know, it was made, what, yes. 35, 40 years ago or something like that? It's made in 1983, and it was shot in Toronto. Yeah, so it's to me, the, I've always thought that'd be cool. So hopefully Christmas Chronicles sticks around, you know, maybe when I'm gone, my kids will watch it or something like that, so there's dad, and, uh, yeah. I don't know. No, no, like, okay, maybe after Henry Golding's movie comes out this year, then maybe I'll take a shot. It's just, Asians in Christmas movies, I, I don't want to be singing far ra 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 <laughs> So well, there's that. You know, there's definitely like, like, that's why I don't want to do it. I, I don't and want to be an Asian now. guy in a, in a Christmas movie. And no. yet Christmas is bigger in the Philippines than anywhere in the world. Oh my God, yeah. 
Did yeah, you, do you guys my know that? Favorite. The Christmas holiday begins in in uh, the Philippines in September. That's when the music comes out and the, the decorations go up. It's like a three month holiday season. I mean, we're the world. happiest people in the world. Yeah. That's, that's for sure. And, and, and when I put, you know, in Western culture, the Asians and, and Christmas movies, I, I don't like the roles that they have. Like, oh, I think that's going to change now, though. I mean, eventually, first we got to, you know, get the stereotypical Asians in there, and then they'll expand to me. Um, have you, now let me ask you that, have you had to face that a lot in your career, going on auditions and going, 100%. you want me to play what? You, I got to say, that? come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah 100%. Uh, like, until now, I'm like, sorry, I'm still turning scripts down. It's like, I, I don't want to put this image out there. I, I don't condone this. I, even, there was a one audition that I just turned down, like, even morally, where it's just, you know, I, I don't want to be under the light of someone who's creepy and rapey. I, yeah. Turning that down, I don't want to have that where my kids looking at like, hey, Dad, you play this very well. Is, I I've interviewed a lot of Asian actors, yeah. and, and one thing that they've said, you know, in some ways it's good because of getting to work, yeah. and in some ways what's bad is they said, you know, Hollywood and, and, and film companies, they don't know the difference between one Asian and another. So yeah, yeah. Japanese actors wind up playing Koreans, and Koreans wind up playing Chinese and everything. Yeah. And um, Paul, and I'm drawing a blank on his last name from Kim's Convenience, when I was talking to him about all this, he said, you know, it seems that Asian actors are still, and slowly going away from that, but they're, it's still okay to jokingly stereotype them in movies. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's Asians of the minority that it's still okay if you throw them in to a movie and it's totally stereotypical. A hundred percent. people go, oh that's fine, because it's 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 Asians. Yeah, yeah. Right? And yeah. he says, you know, but if you if you try to to do that with black actors or or even, you know, a lot of, in, in gay actors a lot of ways today, people are trying to get away from the stereotypes. Mm -hmm. They said, but with Asians they go, yeah, this is fine. Yeah, yeah. I always say like, look, Film and TV is far away from black and white. Yeah, it's it's in color now, but it's still black and white. Yeah, uh, and, then, and that's just the truth that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm currently working towards. I, I would like to help help be not that, yeah. um, it, but it, it is a road that's it's, it's difficult, but it's it's worth it. You know what I mean? It's worth tackling. I mean, it's getting much better. It's getting much better. You got uh, the Crazy Rich Asians. That just that film yeah. is historic. It, it changed a lot for for Asians. Even with Dark Matter, man, uh, Jay Firestone, the, uh, the owner, was like, hey, I knew when I cast you that I was going to get a lot of flack because you're Filipino. Um, and I was like, shit, well, thank you for taking a, sh a chance with me because that I, I get it. It makes sense. The guy's named Rio Ishida. We got dragons all over, which, again, didn't make sense to me. I was like, so he's a samurai, but they're dragons. You guys, you know, cross culture, man, but whatever. Um, and then Joe protected his ass. Look, it's sci fi. You know, this is a place where, and this is why I love sci-fi as well, it's a place where anything is literally possible. And that really opened me up even more to sci-fi. I was just like, okay, this is where I want to be, this is where I need to be, because this is, sci-fi is where you are, even in conventions, you are allowed to be who you are. And there's no, no one can tell you, hey, that's not how it's done. Like, no, this is, this is who I am, this is how I'm presenting myself, whether I'm in my cosplay or not. And, and I love it, and this is the community where, I don't know, it, you are allowed to be your individual self, and you're accepted. There's there's no discrimination in sci-fi. There's a, well, there's very little discrimination in sci-fi. Straight white guy, what's your hardship? You what's, the hardest, what's the hardest part for you? When being you a straight white guy. I can understand. Right I, now? Yeah. Right now, being a straight right, white right guy is the hardest it, part. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> Y'all have it well, we more difficult down, now than ever. I went down to LA two years ago, I got my US visa, and uh, I had, what, six meetings, and they all told me at the time, they said, it would have been a bidding war on you, but two years ago, they said, right now, we can't take any more white guys. Yeah. Yeah. It's the reality right now. The thing right now is, I'm actually fortunate because I go under the list of ambiguous. Yeah, I can see that. So it's everyone's going with ambiguous right in, now. in my world you know it's for the longest time in stand-up comedy it was dominated by straight white guys right straight middle-aged white guys yeah and now comedy is going young younger and uh and and more women and more diversity and it's a good thing 
it's absolutely a good thing, mm -hmm. yeah. you know. But it's also it, it's that reality, you know, that I've I've told my other straight white male comedian friends where I go, you know, we had a good run. <laughs> now, yeah. You know, we, we had a good run, and yeah. and now it's time to let other people come up and and you know people that have been kept away, right? Yeah. And that's and that's the other thing is that we're not talking about it just didn't work out. I mean, literally. Women and minorities in, in show business in general they yeah. kept away, you know, and kept down. What about? And I mean, neither one of you has to worry about this now. But do you ever worry about ageism? Because yeah, you know, you, you do reach a certain age in Hollywood, and that career changes. I mean, we, it's. I find it funny if you would have told everyone ten years ago or so that there would be a string of movies coming out with fifty or sixty year old action stars, right? People would have gone, no way. And that's been a thing now for a little while. But other than that, everyone reaches an age where you go, well, now the roles are going to change and it's going to be a different career. He's a young one, though. You, you, you get a while ago before you have to worry about that. And an age. And your age. I'm not aging until I'm 100. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're, going to look, you're going to look this age until one day you look like 90. Yeah. yeah. And then just a flip of the switch. And, then, and I'll be happy then. I, yeah. yeah. And then you'll still live another 20 years. Yeah. I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm waiting to get those older ages. But I'm, what I am scared of, though, is this CGI technology where they're, um, like the Irishmen, you know what I mean? They're taking the legends and making Make them, them younger. young again. It's I can't compete with De Niro. Well, it, <laughs> I can't compete. They're good. They're how, really fast, good. how fast they're doing that. Oh, it was, my goodness. It was only, yeah. like, about 10 years ago in Benjamin Buttons. Yeah, yeah. They had to show Brad Pitt when he was young again, like he was supposed yeah. to be 17. He was in the darkness, you know what I mean? There were shadows so on his face, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Really? But then you look at Ant-Man and Michael Douglas, you're like, shit, they literally took 40 years off of him. Yeah. And, and it looks like old footage of Michael Douglas somehow. Like, and they did that in just a, a handful of years. They managed to make the technology that good. Even the, yeah, even the voice, there's a, a video that's just come out with Joe Rogan, interviewing Joe Rogan. Have, have you ever heard of it? Joe, Joe Rogan's a famous podcaster, right? he's a comedian as well. But look it up because you can't tell who is Joe Rogan and who's like, it's not just the fact that he sounds like Joe Rogan, the, the way he speaks, um, the, the cadence and everything like that mm -hmm. is dead on. He's, right? he's interviewing like an AI? Like a, yeah, it's an AI. A total and and I, work, I work in voice a lot, thankfully, and it freaked me out even more because I'm thinking, man, they're, they're not going to need us because I can't tell the human versus the, the, you know, the, other, the, the AI. So I think it was like 40 years ago, George Lucas in an interview said that in, in fewer than 100 years, actors would be obsolete and it would all be something that was done digitally. Yeah, yeah. 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 it could definitely, I and mean, that also makes you, again, when you see things in the news sometimes, how long will it be? It was like, no, that didn't happen, but the, the CIA made something happen. Yeah, like sure. that, it's just the, the technology is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, why don't we open it up to uh, some Q and A? We don't have that much time left. I'm just gonna have so much fun with you guys. So, put your uh, put your hands up if you have questions. I saw you first in the red hat. Uh, have you guys thought or would be interested in theater as a kind of a, a way of sort of being engaged with audiences as well as probably covering off you know, I don't, vocal? I, don't, I personally like it. I've never done I'm it. Big. I'm terrified. I even watching my friends in theater. Yeah. Uh, but I, I I played live. On, on stage for you know years as a, as a band, I love that rush and the connection you have. So I do want to try it, but man, like Sean, Sean uh, back up there, he's he, he's done Stratford and things like that. And we talked stories about how he's forgot lines and things like. I, I can't even imagine that. Uh, I got a stomach ache even just thinking about it. Yeah, it's too big for me, man. I, I... And it's a, yeah, it's a different. It's a different. It's yeah. different muscles. Yeah, because yeah. you know, you've got to be small on screen. Like they'll, at the beginning, they're always telling you, you've got to be small and, and let the camera do the work and stuff like that. Whereas, again, on, on stage, you got to be, like you said, big and yeah, the back of the room. Yeah. Man. So, yeah. No. So, I like my TV whisper. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, he's a good actor. <laughs> uh, and that happens to a lot of theater actors who move into. Film and television, right? It yeah. takes them a while to get used yeah. to it. Um, I've seen it where that theater actor gets his first movie role or whatever, forgets his line, and starts improvising because that's what you do in theater. <laughs> yeah. You know, and the director's like, "What are you doing? <laughs> we'll just stop." <laughs> I've never seen that. Uh, go ahead. Um, Dark Matter came out 
was released around the same time as Killjoys. Is there like a sibling rivalry between the two casts? Terrible kind of were launched at the same time? I think, I think online it was, it was, a, it was certainly a friendly rivalry. Yeah, yeah. Because oh. they were a sci-fi original, right? So, and, and we were just licensed by sci-fi to, to air on there. So there was a, a you know, we would go to the back room and look at the numbers from last week's episodes and be like, okay, good, we have to look at it. All right, guys. Um, and and I'm, I'm sure the writer has kept, kept up with it just to make sure that, hey, you know what, we don't cross um, any storylines over that are too similar. And I know they're all friends too, the, the people behind the show. Yeah, because it was Boss Boss Girl, right? Yeah. And, um, I know one thing that we didn't want to do was have actors from Killjoys come over to Dark Matter. Um, we had one mistake. Rob Stewart, right? Rob Stewart, and we didn't let it happen again. And that was on their bad because they didn't check to see what. No, it didn't. They, he didn't have it on his resume yet because the two shows were coming out. So yeah, but in all time. fairness, there's a Canadian content law with the CRTC that every Canadian series has to have Rob Stewart on an episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. Probably right. Roger and, Cross too, though. Yeah. What? And Roger, Roger Cross. Cross. Yeah. And Roger Cross. <laughs> yeah, Roger Cross and everything, man. Questions? Put your hands right up. Do it. Okay. Any more questions? Questions from the kid in the back? <laughs> I'm gonna have to start asking myself questions. Here. Well, I mean, that's, that. that's pretty much it for us. Yeah, uh, the guys are going to go be signing autographs. Make sure you make your way out to the table. Thanks, uh, you can meet them out there. They'll be signing autographs, doing photos and selfies and everything. And I think uh, all of you, uh, give yourselves a round of applause as well. Yes. Thanks, guys. Yeah.